He's lean, he's mean, he's due a telegram from the Queen. Well, nearly. Not Daniel Craig himself, you understand, who remains as lithe and sprightly as ever on location in Istanbul for the forthcoming James Bond movie. No, I'm talking about dear old 007. He made his bow in print back in 1953, the year of the Queen's coronation. And this year is the 50th anniversary of the first Bond film, Dr. No. Whatever the fortunes of dear old Blighty, of the Foreign Office and our true spies, at least there's one Brit who always keeps his end up, 007. The great James Bond franchise is a kind of parallel diplomatic service, bringing James or his doppelgangers to places like Istanbul, recording his exploits and then relaying them to millions of fans around the world. In fact, in his own gruff, brutal, can-do way, the James Bond of the movies and of the books represents a kind of soft power. Wielding the soft power behind the scenes on the Bond set is the producer who's overseen a dozen of the films now, going right back to Moonraker in 1979. Who could be more British than James Bond? Is that still an element of flavour of the movies or has it become so international that some of that's lost, do you think? I think the fact that he is British is an important part of the character, an important part of the attraction from around the world. I think he's a different kind of uh, uh, hero, a different class of hero than you normally get. Michael G. Wilson has also given himself Hitchcock-style cameos in many of the films. See how often you can spot him in these clips. Consider him slime. Some people might say that James Bond is a bit anachronistic now. Do you get that at all? That the idea of a British man going out and, and saving the world or putting wrongs right is, is a bit outdated? Whenever the United States seems to get involved in something, the British are right there to support them. And I, um, we have informally spoken with various people who are part of the British um, SAS and SBS and they are still very active in the world doing things that James Bond like things in the world. So that's, uh, it isn't as far-fetched as, as you might think. We don't do historical films. We do films that are in the present time. So, yes, Bond changes, culture changes as time goes on. Country. England. Gun. Shot. Agent. Provocateur. I think the James Bond narratives, first in books and then in films, have functioned as a sort of barometer of Britain's changing place in the world. In the 1950s, when Fleming was writing the books, relatively soon after the Second World War, Britain could still think of itself as a great power, as a nation in a position of leadership. But increasingly, they've adopted a more critical perspective towards that. So we'll often have a character who makes some comment to the effect of um, uh, your, your minor power, nation in decline, what are you doing here? Hong Kong's our turf now, Bond. Yeah, well, don't worry about it. I'm not here to take it back. Took my down. But we Brits remain extraordinarily fond of Bond. His publishers, Vintage, who are reissuing Ian Fleming's original novels, say that more than two-thirds of us have seen a Bond film. And their focus groups told them that 007 was an old-fashioned British hero, ingrained in British culture. That old spy, what's his secret? In search of answers, I'm attending a covert rendezvous in St. James's, London. This is where Fleming himself is said to have overseen the mixing of the original shaken, not stirred vodka martini, which became Bond's signature tipple. I've got a license to grill best-selling author William Boyd, who signed on to write a fresh Bond story set in 1969, he says. 
when the books first came out, what do you think it was about them that so appealed to people that caught the imagination? Well, I think you have to remember that the first book appeared in 1953, you know, so I think rationing was still going on in Britain uh, then. Um, and of course, you again forget London was a city of, of, of bomb sites. We had won the war, but maybe it didn't look or feel like it. it in a way, it was Fleming's wish fulfillment, but it sort of became the nation or the readers of Bond uh, a, a collective wish fulfillment because you know, he was cool and capable and something of a dandy and chose his clothes well. How do we think of him now? Is it a nostalgic exercise? The period aspect of, of Bond, in a way, is a strength, it seems to me. Um, it's far more uh, educative, in a funny sort of way, or, or in interesting to imagine uh, this man on a mission uh, in the field, you know, uh, as, you know, I assume it sort of happens to, to nowadays, but it does seem like a bygone age. Yes, he'd probably be working in a call centre, <laughs> monitoring all the phone calls. That's right, or GCHQ, you know, uh, not quite so exciting. And Bond's successors have had the humiliating experience of making the evening news around the world with their flops such as this abortive incursion by British Special Forces into Libya before the fall of Gaddafi. Can it be true that the Savile Row Secret Service of James Bond is now a bit, well, pants? The strongest thing that, that Britain had around the world was we were not America. As I say, if, if you look in the Middle East, for instance, the handling of the mandate, there was this sense that the British got out, but they did try and play, you know, be as even as possible with both sides. Since 9-11, the image of the British, because we've been working together with them on, on the battlefield and elsewhere, has been that there is, is not a playing card of difference between a British secret agent and an American secret agent. Take it down, I want a closer look. Closer look at what? Never mind, take it down quick. At least we Brits can make believe we're the top dogs in the Bond movies, says a rock star who wrote a song for one of them. What was brilliant about those movies is that he had uh, Felix, the American CIA counterpart, who was sort of a second banana to him, who wasn't as cool or hip. And amazing that that sold to American audiences that way, that they were okay with that. Well, hello, double O. Strangely, it seems as though Bond's world and the one the rest of us live in are converging. I think the more recent films, particularly the Daniel Craig films, um, reflect a sense of uncertainty, both about Britain's place in the world, but who about who the enemy really is. So we're no longer dealing with the ideological certainty of the Cold War. We now have these shadowy cartels. Significantly, in both Casino Royale and in Quantum of Solace, we've had internal treachery um, within the Secret Service. And that's something we've not really addressed before in the Bond films. In the Cold War, we were hoping never to come to blows, so it was all about recruiting long-term agents, about gradually learning more about what the Russians were planning. Now we live in a world where a drone can deliver a missile and, and wipe out one of our enemies without any judicial process, without any oversight, um, and intelligence is feeding into that world. The idea is that once intelligence officers have identified somebody as a terrorist, he becomes a legitimate target. So in that sense, we probably have approached nearer to the Bond world, That's where intelligence is saying our enemies are these black hats, and it's legitimate that we can can kill them. Some men are coming to kill us. We're going to kill them first. So Bond is oddly relevant, even after all these years. That's good news for those of us who've ever fancied stepping into his handmade brogues. Whether I'd like to be James Bond, is, I think it's probably a, a, um, a waste of time imagining. imagining we we all would a bit, wouldn't a we? Bit, us but chaps. We're, we're all, we're all, we're, if we're honest, we're all far too cowardly and risk averse to, uh, to, to be James Bond. But later at the BBC Gun Club. How was that? Because I've got to get the suit back to Radio 3. Can we not? Oh, okay. Beautiful. 